As I was um, thinking through parts of your presentation, what was going through my mind is the implicit messages that get communicated to kids and family through our healthcare system. And in particular, I think our entire system is set up around the question of, there is something wrong with you, or is there something wrong with, with your brain or your family? Our diagnostic system is set up based on that, and then our funders or payers rely on that to be able to approve you know, stays or treatment or whatever it is. Um, and you, I think, very accurately point out that's entirely the wrong focus and the wrong question to be asking. The question is what has happened to you. So my question is, what you know is coming down the pipeline, or what do you think about in terms of policy change when it comes to health care that really kind of um, takes this, this very essential work that you're doing and, and makes it applicable to the, the payers and the funding streams? So. OK, great question. One of my favorite champions for ACEs research and trauma-informed care approaches is Dr. Nadine Burke Harris. Have any of you heard of Dr. Nadine Burke Harris? Oh, I have just rocked your world. Go do two things. One, check out the book. It's in the library. Um, or you can download it. I downloaded it on my Kindle. It was like a dollar. Or you can buy the old fashioned book um, called uh, The Deepest Well. That is a book that came out about a year ago, written by Dr. Nadine Burke Harris about ACEs and trauma-informed care. She is a pediatrician, and her experience working within the medical community trying to implement these changes is well documented. Um, one of the favorite quotes from her is, of mine, is she talks about how frequently as a pediatrician, kids were brought to her office because the child had ADHD. And she said, these kids have an ACE score of seven. The last thing they need is a stimulant, right? And so um, she talks a lot about how challenging it is to change this medical model to a more systems model and address those issues. So she is uh, now just recently named the first Surgeon General of the state of California. Um, and so she is in the right place to make these changes. So that's one thought is. Um, she also, if you're not a big book person, she has a TED Talk um, that if you just Google Nadine Burke Harris TED Talk Aces, it'll come up. She's wearing a beautiful red dress. Uh, then you'll know you've got the right one. Um, and you know, the other challenge with the medical system is that <laughs> And it's a dumb challenge, but when they hear trauma, they think car accident. Yes. And so we've got to help them understand that the brain can experience um, emotional trauma and that that's just as devastating to their uh, physical health as a car accident. So we're working through all of those challenges. You're absolutely right. Um, this whole dealing with individuals and just giving them a pill concept that we have in America is, is working counter to the systems changes that we need to implement to really make a difference. I work in the school system, and I find that we're often kind of triage for some of the, the kiddos that we see and the parents, um, kind of the first line of defense, what's going on, and also a link between services for our children and parents and the children themselves, of course. Um, do you have any suggestions for resources that we can guide our parents to or resources that we can use in the school? Our time is limited with the children. Often there's um, you know, constraints around what we can do, but we need to do something. So any suggestions? Thank you. Um, yes, so some suggestions. I am actually presenting at Region 20 superintendents meeting in some time. Um, I think in August sometime. And so we're going to be talking about how to make sure that all of the boots on the ground folks in the schools have access to all the appropriate resources that they need in order to, because the first step towards trauma-informed care is just a trauma-informed lens. 
And so we want, want to make sure that, that people at least are using that trauma-informed lens before they can go all the way down the path of fully trauma-informed care certified organizations. Um, so we'll be working um, with the superintendents. I've also talked to a number of um, teachers and counselors at schools, and so I'm hoping that from the bottom-up and the top-down approach, we're going to get the right things to the schools uh, at the right time. There's also, like I said, that entire sector that's focused on K through 12 um, that's also thinking through how to do the training pieces. Um, because we, you know, we could just throw out a bunch of trainings, but we know that you have requirements for hours and it has to meet certain standards and we want to make sure to do that so that you're not just doing this extra as actually counting towards your required training and helping um, improve this trauma-informed lens approach. So um, that was one thing that I wanted to say. The, the thing for, for parents, um, the easiest advice that, that I could give if they really do want to um, do something different and they're motivated to, to make a time investment is to transition to conscious discipline. Um, there are, again, a ton of books in the libraries about conscious discipline that parents can check out. They can get them on their Kindles. They can get them on Amazon.com. Um, it helps parents understand how to discipline their kids without invoking fear. And that's a great first step for our parents to take. Is there research that shows what is the wrong kind of stressors on us that, that force these epigenetic changes versus the positive ones? So uh, the research is not quite as sophisticated as we would like it to be. But the short answer is, and, and the reason why I have limited ACEs to the 10 items is because it seems like every time I turn around, there's somebody else trying to make a research argument that this particular trauma also causes toxic stress and is bad for your long-term health. Um, this has decades of research behind it, so I'm very confident that these 10 things that we talked about for the ACEs, um, there, is a, there is a definite um, connection between that type of trauma and everything that I've talked about today. Um, the nuance is that different people are more or less susceptible to the experience of trauma. Um, and some of that has to do with how much of their parents' trauma they inherited um, versus how much of this is the first generation of trauma. Um, and some of it does have to do with and not just the physical environment, but the environment around this child. Do they have grandparents, for example, who are mitigating some of this stress and being that safe, stable, nurturing person in their lives? So there's like a million different ways to slice this, and I've oversimplified it for the purposes of a you know, one and a half hour presentation. But the bottom line is, if something is happening that's making kids feel afraid, we ought to stop it. Hi, thank you very much. This is a wonderful talk. Um, my name is Teresa Velasquez. I'm a general pediatrician, and I work at a federally qualified health center in rural Texas. I live in, a, we work in Luling and Lockhart, so we're Kamal County. And um, I come to these talks to try to bring as much as I can to take back home. In our little community, you know, it's less than, you know, 5,000 people. Two thirds of our children at the school level qualify. Uh, for the, um, under the federal poverty guidelines. Mm -hmm. So I'd say probably most of our children, their ACEs scores are four or above. Um, most of these children's parents and are also ACEs four and above. Um, so we take care of, you know, obviously their parents and the adults in our community. Resources are thin and it's wonderful what you guys are doing in Bear County. Um, we have, MHMR, Blue Bonnet Trails, that does a medical home model with us. So they're kind of our little bridge and they're very, very helpful. And they've talked to us about this, but um, as a pediatrician trying to bring stuff home to them, number one, it would be wonderful to kind of be invited to maybe join in on your consortium, but also maybe to consider uh, including some of the rural counties because we don't have the resources, nor do we have the time to wait 
five years um, for help. Yeah. And so I, I guess that's the thing is that, you know, can these tools become accessible, like you said, online or to join the consortium? Uh, we work with St. David's um, Foundation and Methodist Ministries mm -hmm. is one of the faith-based foundations. It gives us a lot of grant monies uh, to perhaps be able to bring a, a program like this to primary care. Yeah. Uh, we do it on the MHMR side, but I do see a lot of, like, we work together, but we're side by side and the confidentiality and why do you want to know this information about a family's mental health problems? You're the primary pediatrician. You should just be worried about the shots. And I'm mm -hmm. like, this impacts everything that I do with the families. And um, so I find even though we're all uh, mental health providers and we want to do that job, that sometimes your license for mental health restricts you from talking to me and we have to have extra medical releases and, you know, oh, you didn't get the right release so I can't talk to you. And I'm like, what the hell? You yeah, know, it's like, yeah. you know, I'm not gonna, you know, so, um, so my point is if we even create these barriers to being able to talk about mental health issues in a very, just like we would asthma, Right. to say it's let's reduce the stigma yes. and just get over it and help each other but also to work I think more inclusively as a team just to have it as part of the we do the PHQ at every visit mm -hmm. so we catch a lot of people a lot of children a lot of families and we try to intervene but my appointments are 15 minutes for an acute 30 right. for a well right. and um, the only thing like the gentleman was talking about getting recognition from a um, from the insurances and from the companies are, they look at the numbers. Yeah. Um, you know, you're only seeing 15 chronically ill kids a day. You're a slacker, how come you're not seeing 30? Yeah. And it's like, these kids are, you know, their ACE scores are through the roof and they really do need the time. Yeah. And I know you're like, what's your question? But <laughs> you're like, what? Okay. But um, so I guess, um, I guess my bigger question is, you know, have you thought about the looking at you know ground one a big urban center with funding to how do you work with the rural communities and yes. the fqhcs and the private pediatricians who you know are ground zero yes so thank um, you yes thank you um my very first job was at an fqhc so i have great love for community health centers um technically the name of our trauma-informed care consortium is the South Texas Trauma-Informed Care Consortium. So um, that we did that intentionally because we do want to grow and expand and include um, our, our, our rural partners in it. Um, Methodist Healthcare Ministries is a big uh, philanthropic partner in this work. So I think between them and um, our ultimate goal of it being South Texas, we'll be able to um, eventually encompass the other counties that are more rural. Um, so I know, it's like everybody's super excited, when can we start, when can we start? And I'm like, okay, okay, baby steps, baby steps. But I hear you, I hear you. Hi, thank you so much um, for discussing everything you have today, I really appreciate it. Um, I wanna thank the individual that brought up teachers um, and especially those working with like boots on the ground, working with children firsthand. Um, I want to say that um, I came from a wonderful childhood. My mother is here with me today. Um, I'm also a survivor of domestic violence. Um, I'm also a teacher, and um, my 10-year-old son um, had a major psychotic break this year. Um, there is still trauma that he experiences with his father. Um, he has received treatment at Clarity, and it's been amazing. Um, but one of the things you just mentioned about that you're that you'll be meeting with the superintendents at Region 20. Um, I really hope that you can reiterate to them that is important. it's important that teachers understand more about mental health. And my mother and I were actually talking about it this morning, um, that we feel that it should be mandatory, that teachers should understand because um, I'm going on my 16th year in education uh, because I've experienced so much of these things personally. Um, I feel like I can help children get through this, as you mentioned before. But I feel that there are a lot of teachers that don't understand. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's just because of lack of training or lack of understanding. Um, but I feel like this is something to be mentioned to superintendents that it needs to be 
um, I guess it needs to be taught to teachers more so they understand these warning signs um, because sometimes it's not apparent, like you mentioned. And so um, I don't really have a question so much as I wanted to share my story and just if you could please tell the superintendents um, how crucial it is to get this across to their teachers. Thank oh, you so much. Absolutely, thank you. Hi, this is actually just a follow-up to your comment about conscious parenting. I just wanted to let folks know that on October 18th here in San Antonio, Regina Pally, who has written a book about reflective parenting, will be presenting a day-long workshop sponsored by the Psychological Association. And so she'll be talking just about, for parents and people who work with parents, how to teach communication um, and reflection mindfulness for parents that, that will address exactly the issues you've Perfect. been speaking Thank about. you. So. Thank you for sharing that. Well, thank you so much for the work that you do. Um, I wasn't going to come up, but then with some of the great questions, the things that you talked about, I thought our audience would love to know that there are some other great things that confirm the work that's going on in San Antonio. Uh, I happen to be on the board of the Texas Juvenile Justice Department. And what's exciting about what's going on in our juvenile justice system is they have adopted the trauma-informed care model. Yes. And we now have our own Texas model. And you can look that up. And it's cool, like here, simple example is we're no longer calling um, the people who work with the kids in the detention facilities, juvenile correctional officers. Now they're, they're called like life coaches. And so that's pretty cool. It sounds corny, but it's, it's a big it difference better. because yeah. it influences how the workers interact with the kids. No surprise, most of those kids have five, six, seven on their A scores. And so that's very exciting going on in that system. We would love more folks with the training and education that you all have to maybe consider that as a career, too. No, I mean, no, no. How no, cool no, would that be? Don't leave your job. Don't leave your job. <laughs> Jessica, kill well, me. We got to heal those kids, too. <laughs> All right, and then the other point I thought I'd share is just based on what the doctor just brought up. You know, Superior, we had Dr. Burns Banks here yesterday, and Superior is working with her clinics, creating something called Centers of Excellence. That's pretty cool. That would be something I think that would be exciting to also start in the rural areas as well, and somebody with your influence maybe could have a phone call to Superior and say, hey, I know the, just the perfect clinic to start bringing this to the rural area. So, or doctor, get wherever you're sitting, give Superior a call. Ask for a Dr. Valerie Smith. She's the consultant um, doing that for here in San Antonio, working with Dr. Burns Banks. So I just wanted to share that good information. Thank you. I'm uh, Mary Baird. I'm a CPS caseworker. And uh, we work with foster kids who are definitely traumatized. And our judges lately are really interested in TBRI trust-based relational intervention. Yes. And I wondered what you thought the relationship would be between that and trauma-based therapy. Thank you. OK, so huge fan of TBRI. Um, TBRI is one of the trainings that we endorsed as part of So May was Trauma-Informed Care Awareness Month. Hopefully you all heard something. Um, but we had a month of different training opportunities for professionals and parents to go through, and we'll do that on an annual basis. But TBRI was one of those trainings um, and is definitely trauma-informed, and we would love for everybody in the entire city to go through that training. So yes, two thumbs up for TBRI. All right, thank you all.